and then we are going to talk about the limitations of human dynamic monitoring. So there's a lot of things we can do with human dynamic monitoring to help guide our resuscitation, guide our use of pressors and ionic tropes, uh, but there are certain kind of traps you can follow to too, um, and we're going to get into that. So kind of starting from the basics, what is a central line? And I'm, this is informal, but I am going to be calling on you guys because I think that makes this go a lot, bit, a lot more fun. So Ron, what is a central line in your eyes? It's the catheter placed into a large vessel. I, that is perfect. So, I mean, so it's an invasive venous line placed past the peripheral vasculature in the thoracic portion of the SVC 9C or RA. That being said, your definition for our job is better. It is a venous line placed in a big vessel. Um, the reality is, if you look at x rays, a lot of central lines are going to terminate before the SVC, before the IVC. Technically, it's supposed to be in the central third of the SVC. If you go to the ICU, they might adjust these by a couple centimeters. We don't care. If it's in the very edge of the SVC, if it's in the very end of the subclavian, data shows that these are not problems. These are not going to cause complications. Um, so large line, large vein. That's a really good way to think about it. Now the uh, less irritability, more flow. Exactly. Just a bigger wall, slightly bigger wall, bigger wall of vessel. A better flow, less chance of stenosis, causing um, notable stenosis. Um, these are all reasons why central vessels are preferred. But pragmatically speaking, the last millimeter of subclavian versus the first millimeter of the SBC, um, that's not going to affect our us in route by any means. Eight versus your eight. Yeah. Right. Um, and then central lines are also advantageous. Right? We'll talk about more because they're long. So not only when you think about peripheral IVs, the fluid is coming out very close to where the puncture is. So even if the catheter remains in the vessel, you have a chance to get backflow and extravasation because of that. How many times have you dug for an IV? And by the time you actually get the needle in, there's only this much catheter left. Right, that's a major problem. So not only are central lines advantageous because of the vessel we're using, but because of the actual characteristics of the line itself. You're infusing very far away from the puncture point, um, which is very helpful. So in your guys' experience, where have you seen central lines placed? Where can you place a central line? I'm kind of giving it away here with this chart, but. Right, so if you look up, so right IJ is probably the most common spot for a central line being placed. And if you look at that, right, if you put a line of right IJ, it goes down the IJ, hits the subclavian, and goes pretty much straight down into the SVC. So it's a straight shot. You can put them in the left IJ, but you have to make a 90 degree turn into the subclavian and another 90 degree turn down into that SVC. So these can be harder to spread. Uh, your C providers having more complications. Um, and just more shenanigans. We see a lot of femoral lines in emergency situations. Um, it's not uncommon for people to do a femoral um, central line and a femoral arterial line at the same time in a crash location. Some people call it the dirty Get down there, do a quick and dirty crap, um, and do it all at once. There's nothing going on down there. Yeah, yeah right. There's a lot. So there. we see that a lot in our small facilities. I don't know if your experience is similar. That's, that's um, my experience. Yeah, Rock Springs. So yeah, yeah. sick people in Rock Springs, they love this. Right. And then you look at, we can, we'll get into why, but if you're working at a decent sized hospital with good resources, the more lines can end up having vascular complications. If, prohibits mobility later on the line. It can cause a high rate of central line infection. But when your patient's crashing in a small facility, they don't break. These are downstream problems. It doesn't mean we don't care, but it also means it's not going to guide their choice of line. They're going to get whatever line they can get. So realistically, you're going to see a lot more lane catheters. Then you have and then you can have pick lines. Um, pick lines are your unique, right? They're peripherally inserted central catheters. They come in for the brachial. You can have these on steam halls, right? People go home with pick lines for long term antibiotic use, or um, not generally chemo would have a, a tunnel port, but if you're, you might see these um, on steam and you might be taken aback just because we don't think about IV access being present always. 
but that can definitely work to our advantage. Um, so when we talk about why we use central lines and what are the indications of central lines, I think in this job, the best question is, what are problems you guys have encountered with peripheral vascular, peripheral IV access? What, what issues have you had with peripheral? Perfect. Yep. Yeah, they can work and then they don't. They kink, right? If our patient's calm, quiet, and lay like a board with their arms out straight. No, no patients. <laughs> yeah, they can be very challenging. So instead of saying, I have a certain indication in flight for a central line to ask the provider to give us one, I want you guys to be thinking, is my, am I, do I suspect my peripheral access will fail me in a dangerous way? Because, right, we're, we're quick and dirty overall. We want to get in, we want to get out, but that doesn't mean we rush when our patient safety is compromised. So classic indications for central line use was vasal pressure administration. So for many, many, many years, right, every ICU patient who got vasal pressures got a central line. A bunch of good studies starting in 2015 started showing that peripheral basal pressure administration is very safe in a hospital setting. Um, the U has a new policy that's in your guys' packets, I believe, um, that allows for elective peripheral basal pressure administration for up to 48 hours. Obviously, as ground medics, flight medics, you guys give a lot of peripheral basal pressors. We are going to give a lot of peripheral basal pressors. That being said, right, there are risks. Extravasation, um, basal pressors can cause significant tissue necrosis. Um, so we want to be as careful as possible. There are antidotes for infiltrated basal pressors, but we don't care about them. Metro paste and fitpolity. So central lines can be useful for administration of other vesicants. So what, Nick, in your last job, what other vesicants did you carry in your drug bag? What's a classic one that's for nausea that causes really bad tissue damage? Oh, um, and no. Yeah, right. The perfect. So there, uh, calcium chloride is a horrible vesicant without a good antidote. So um, amiodarone is pretty can be a little nasty. Um, those are three pretty big ones. The um, it's really bad, right? That's got our. Um, so again, we're not going to get central lines for those drugs. But if you have a central line, that's when you want those are drugs you want to be focusing on making sure they go through central access. Um, a big one is invasive hemodynamic monitoring, which is a big part of our talk today. So that's a reason to get a central line. Large volume resuscitation uh, in the trauma bay. That being said, not every central line is built the same, right? So not every central line is actually great for large volume resuscitation. And we'll talk about flow rates. Um, sometimes a peripheral IV can flow faster, but it might be less reliable. So do you want to take a short thing at a slower rate? Or do you want to start pressure bagging blood into your 16 and AC that's tucked under the blanket. Their arm is like this. And if it infiltrates, you might not know. And there's there's not a lot right answer to a lot of these questions. We're just going to talk about the pros and cons. Um, Long-term antibiotic use, but we don't really have to deal with that in our job. So when you guys get to the bedside and there is a central line, we want to make sure it's in the right place. Right, there's a variety of techniques that you can use to confirm a central line. And like I said, a lot of quote placement errors are inconsequential. If it's a millimeter shy of the SVC and it's in the subclavian, we don't really care about that. But if they go right out of J, they come all the way across the subclavian and up the contralateral, um, oh, sorry, if you go left that, um, yeah, the contralateral IJ, up to, um, that can impede the drainage, can infuse medications backwards infusion up into the cerebral circulation, that can be a problem. Um, yeah, so right, these are, so again, we're talking, what is gonna hurt? We need to confirm that this line is safe to use, not that this line is perfect. So what are some places, if you're trying to put a central line in a large bean schedule, Ron, what are some places you could accidentally put it instead? In a central line? Yeah, if we're trying to place a central line in a bean vein, where could you accidentally put it by mistake? Right yep, it could, be, it could be deep in the right atrium. And in the end, that's actually, that's not very problematic. We can introduce medications for right atrium, but that's absolutely a place we can What are some other places that could end up by mistake? Perfect. So, right, when you look at the femoral vein and the femoral artery, the carotid and the IJ, they run right on top of each other. 
So you can end up with an arterial placement by accident. Accidentally. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not perforating one into the other, but accidentally. You can accidentally just place, place it right in the crowd. Yeah, you're not. Yeah. Anecdotally, in six years in ICU, we'd see two or three carotid artery punctures, usually a year. Um, sometimes they catch it once they've just put the needle in, and that's not a big deal. You pull the needle out and hold the pressure. Once they put the, once they dilate and put the line in, you need a vascular surgeon. So even if they catch it before they use it, they're going to need a vascular surgeon to get it. Generally, this way of puncturing the artery, or do they perforate through? You can just great question. You can go through and through, okay. or you can misidentify the vessel on the ultrasound from the get go. So sometimes they think that they're dead center the whole time. Other times they lose their needle tip, but they have good on the ultrasound, but they have good blood return, and they're like, "Well, I lost it on the ultrasound, but it looks great." Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that has a lot to do with probe angle. Absolutely, yeah. Losing your needle tip can absolutely have a lot to do with probe angle. Yeah, they're like restricted. Won't turn their head all the way to the side. So if you're like this, the crowd is pretty far away, but you haven't made a pretty big mistake. Is there more of a new line? Our head? You said pretty close to the other. So, what are some other complications that we need to know with capital central line placement? Yep. So, hemorrhage, hematoma. What happens if you get a rebound hematoma on the neck eventually? Carotids and your airway, you're right. You're going to have compromised airway from a coagulopathic patient with hematoma. Um, pneumothorax is, especially with the clavian lines, was a very severe complication. Um, so, right, we've got our tear replacement, you got the perfect extra vascular replacement. You can just not be in a vessel. So, you can end up with a cavity. Um, there's case reports of people getting blood Belmont and into their central line, and their chest tubes are dumping. If they're pressure, but they're bell locking it right into the thoracic cavity because they went through and through. Step in the subcute tissue, right? They could have just missed. They could have gone through and through into this tissue. Yep, yeah, you can have a false crack. So it can just be, it can be the wrong vessel. It can be not in a vessel at all. Pneumothorax in the subclavian insertion. Um, if you ever watched a subclavian line by ultrasound, which is a slightly newer thing that they're doing, that was the traditional blind placement. Like, the needle tip is basically right in the pleura under the clavicle. Um, it's very close. So you can cause pneumothorax, um, hematoma in the coagulopathic patient, or even the non coagulopathic patient. If you've got someone in a couple holes in the carotid on their way to the IJ, that's a problem. So when we confirm placement, right, there's a couple ways to confirm placement the x ray, ultrasound and waveform monitoring. You guys are not going to be expected, right, to you to read x-rays. A lot of people are already good at that. Um, I happen to suck at reading x-rays, despite having looked at it for a very long time. Um, nor are you expected to use the ultrasound to confirm. What I want, what you guys need to be able to do is have that see the forest through the trees approach. You're going to come into these chaotic situations, and you're going to say, huh, you guys said you, I'm getting you guys put a central line in, it was really challenging, your pressors aren't working very well. And I want you guys to be asking, well, have you used, have you got an x-ray? Has anyone looked at that x-ray? You'd be surprised by how many times they shoot an x-ray in a small hospital and they wait for the person remotely to read it. And the doc doesn't even have time to look at it. Um, so you guys are gonna be picking up on their signs that people need to slow down and we need to confirm replacement. It's not on you to confirm it necessarily, but it's on you to realize there's a safety issue here. We need to double check what's going on with this line. These are questions. These are, and you guys, especially, you guys have that spidey sense of like, this is weird. This isn't great. That's like, you know, you should be asking on every patient, but you're going to get in these situations where you're like, we really need to, I need to find out how they quote confirm this central line. Um, and you can ask ED doc for help. They know every guy's very softly. But they might need you to remind them, hey, we need to look at the x-ray a little bit closer. So x-ray is the classic gold standard. Um, it takes time in small hospitals. They sometimes wait for the remote radiologist to read it. So a lot of people are now using ultrasound to confirm line placement, at least initially, so they can use it right away. 
but x-ray remains the gold standard x-ray is going to pick up the line going can i ask you something what you're saying is if we're exactly if you're too short i mean again that's the case again to won't be on you to read that x-ray to make sure it's done and it's been interpreted by someone who knows how but i mean x-ray skills are great if you have them or you want to develop them that's awesome i'm, I'm not the guy to teach you but there's plenty of people in this program who are really good at it and can help you with that. Um, but right, so that's gonna that's gonna show you so you get placement across. So an X-ray is helpful, but X-ray is slow. So ultrasound is used for line placement, right, in two ways. Um, during line placement, right, it can help you ultrasound guide in IJ is gonna let them identify the IJ and the carotid and actually see the needle tip and the vessel. So it helps us put it in the right spot to begin with. After you've placed it, most ED docs who can place a line can get a good view of the rate of the brain atrium. And if you power flush the central line in about a second or two later, you're going to see um, shadowing and basically fun. You're basically going to see static in the RA. You're going to see the turbulence of that line being flushed. So you're going to see that at the bedside a lot um, just to confirm, hey, you guys are good to use this line. We're still going to get an X-ray. But again, if you guys are in this chaotic situation, you're not sure where it is, you can sort of, you can ask an ED doc, hey, can we double check with the ultrasound? Can you fill up for a long and then I'll flush it? Again, we need, you guys need to be recommending ways to confirm it if they haven't done so. And then the other option to differentiate between carotid artery or femoral artery placement, um, any arterial placement versus venous placement, is to up a transducer. So, um, Ron, have you ever used transducers before? Okay, are you familiar with, yeah. Yeah. so you've seen A-lines at Sweetwater before yes. on the monitor? So right, this is an arterial waveform. A couple ways we know. It is large, right? This guy has a blood pressure of 167 over 69. It has a dichrotic notch. Um, and the so those are, you don't need to know all the nuances perfectly of, is it a great waveform, is it perfect? You just need to be able to recognize arterial. And an arterial pressure is gonna be way different than a venous pressure, right? So if you're 50 or above, you right away know your arterial. If you've got clear pulsatility like this, or that chronic notch, your arterial. This is a venous waveform. Um, they have what is called AC and B waves that is not useful for our job. The venous waveform is low amplitude, it's undulating, and even in the patients with the highest DVP you're ever gonna see, even if they're tamponading, right, it's gonna be under 40, um, and realistically under 30 probably. But if you took worst case scenario for someone, um, so in, in real life, they become pretty easy to differentiate between, but that's, you can hook up a transducer to your line, and if it's arterial, you're gonna know real quick. Any questions on any of that? There are multiple ways to secure a central line, but right, the gold standard is suture. It's either suture or it's a commercially provided device. It's called a stat lock. Now, we're not there to critique people's suturing techniques, right? This guy did a great job. He sutured the little wings that are there. This guy wrapped the suture around the, did kind of a slightly uglier job, I would argue, but it should be sutured in um, somewhere. I hate the word, there's never a never, right? But I would argue there was almost never, ever an appropriate circumstance to throw a piece of tape on a central line. Right? When you're going to see a poorly secured central line is when the situation is really bad and they're panicking. I've seen a doc put a central line in, who obviously is very capable of suturing, to put a central line in, throw a piece of tape on it, and tell me you have to go. My argument to him and is, if it is so bad that he doesn't think he has a minute and 20 seconds to put a suture in, if you lose that line of flight, that person is certainly dead. Um, so it is never appropriate to find an unsecured central line, but you will see it, um, you will see it you know, pursue your jobs, um, in that case, reinforcing with a tegator or a tape as needed as possible, but don't be shy about asking for an extra shooter and just be very clear about this, so looking at F, that's not okay. Um, and again, just the worst
worse the situation, the more dependent the central line they're going to be. It's when you're going to find these very poor securement jobs, um, which is unfortunate because that's when you really need that central line to stay in, right? Um, so it's up to us to kind of be that voice of reason and advocate for a uh, better securement strategy. What is going on? Will they turn their head? And now it's now hard. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of that yet. Like, what is happening? Yeah. Oh, I see what happened. And you've flown, well, well, you've flown swans before, so you've probably seen a lot of FP from the swan being in the RFP. That's a classic. All right. So we've got a ton of different types of central lines. They're all pretty similar, but they all have special kind of unique properties. And again, we want to figure out how can we use these most effectively and what complications do we have to watch out for? So this is a triple and quad women. So when you use ground transport from Sweetwater to the correct? So you can take locations of central lines. Usually fine. Okay. I mean, Oh yeah, we can. We can just yeah. Got two bases. Oh, no, actually. That's perfect. I'll do that a little later. I'm kind of going over the individual lines. Cool. Thanks, Jason. All right. So, this is actually a double looming catheter, but it's the same small bore. This is pretty much what a triple and quad lumen looks like. I don't have one. So this is what you're going to see most common, um, is a small or IJ catheter. Um, and there's a couple things to get here. If you look, these two tells you on the line, which is the port and which is the proximal port, so it's not this box, and it tells you what gauge they are. So this is the big one. These happen to be the same gauge in both port okay. Um And a lot of the triple in the kit we have with you has an 18 and a 16 14. Um, so remember for gauge, what's bigger? 14, 14 gauge, right? So it's the opposite. If you go down with gauge, you go up in size. What about for French? If you go from six French to uh, eight French, eight's bigger. eight's bigger, right? Or opposite. So it's not hard, but just keeping that in mind. So if you have a central line with multiple ports, right? If you look at them, um, you can easily decide well, what is my best port for bowling or chest catering. Especially as long as these go. Yeah, and that is, well, they're long and skinny. You nail it, right? That's not great for mass transfusion. You're going to see this a lot. So you're going to run their circumstance where you are going to have a triple lumen or quad lumen, which is even skinnier, each lumen, in the neck. And you're also going to have a 16 in the AC, which flows faster. The AC. But if you've seen, and I don't, did you guys fly 407 No, oh, the A-Stars. A-Stars. So you guys were on the bench. So if you only, you didn't have great access, but what was certain me there? Yeah, I can. So the way that our pieces are packaged is even for, even the AC, from the AC down, you can't get to very well. So you want slightly faster fold rates, but if the flow gets sluggish, you're wondering, is it infiltrated? Is it just bent a little? I can't see it. Or do you want this longer, skinnier catheter that, you know, it might not be quite as fast, but if it's a little sluggish, you can just flush it. You can up the pressure. You build that's in the right spot as long as nothing tragic has happened. Um, so there's no perfect answer. I use an air towards central line, even if it is a quad and it's long and skinny. Um, but that is, this is what you're going to see most often. And so I have never seen a central line and but usually uh, that isn't distal on the brown port, but because there's a lot of companies that I haven't used, I always tell people to check. And Ron, the biggest thing um, you traditionally will, tr if you're transducing pressures, you transduce it off the distal port. 
Um, that being said, you can transduce it. Distal versus proximal um, is less important, honestly, than the size of the lumen. Um, but if you are transducing pressure, it's traditional practice is to use the distal port. It always seems to be backwards to make it the distal port. It's going to be affected. Well, and it's going to be affected in theory, right, by a high flow rate yeah. going by it. Right. So I agree. Um, so honestly, distal and proximal doesn't really play into your decision making a whole lot. But you do want to inspect it for size um, for size of port, and that's all going to be labeled on the line itself. And, and the next, the most important line, um, multi-lumen access catheter is a very pragmatic abbreviation. So a MAC is a nine French catheter, which as you can tell is extremely wide um, compared to the double lumen. Right? So this same catheter can have four ports spliced into it versus this nine French only has two, right? So it's much, much Jeez. bigger. And like Nick said, this is a short trip central line. This is the 15 centimeter. Um, a lot of times these are 20. So it's huge, it's short, it's better for volume transfusion, right? Um, so this, this, this has a port that is nine French, and then it has a proximal gauge. It's great that they mix the two, um, but the flow rate of the large port is and what literature you look at on their site on air, they say five to 10 times faster. Um, so this is in the trauma rate to you, this is the line they use. Um, you're gonna see this in some smaller and mid-sized facilities. You're gonna see it a lot on MCF flights and cardiac flights, because this is how you insert a swan. So when you're using this line for resuscitation, it's not gonna have anything in the middle here. It's gonna have the two ports, you're gonna use the big brown one. That's the fastest, that's the widest, fastest port you have. And then this lights, you're going to see, as you, if we look at the swan board here, you've got your mat, you've got your swan, push through the mat, and shred it all the way up in the pulmonary artery. So, we'll put this down for you. And the way that works, this is literally a one way valve. We're going to, Right, right through. Um, so you're going to see this, yeah, in two two situations: acute trauma resuscitation and MCS flight. Every MCS flight, almost not every, but the vast majority. So in the middle one. So you can put it in five. And the key, so reason that we don't, you're not going to see anything in the middle in trauma resuscitation. If you put something in the middle, you're going to cut your flow rates. Um, by a factor of three to four, according to Arrow. So it's just used double lumen large uh, borderline for trauma resuscitation. But as uh, Nick was saying, you can float a triple lumen through it to get yourself five access ports. You can put a swan through it. Uh, in a pinch, people will put a transvenous pacer through it, but it's not the right line because it doesn't, we'll talk about that as a secure right. Uh, but this is a really classic line. But again, remembering the flow rate on this ground port. The last one you looked at, the sizes are the same between the two portions. You're going to be looking at five to ten times the flow rate if you choose the right port versus the wrong port on the map. So that's really important. But I think like we're talking um, Yeah, the, I mean, when it's flesh replaced and functioning well, the Belmont, at least our Belmont, I mean, get to a uh, uh, thousand mils a minute, I believe. Um, but that's machine, that could be machine limited, not flow limited on the catheter. So it works very well. All right. The next, the bell bomb will be that fast. So this is only go 999 on the phone. Yeah, Belmont's a mess. Oh yeah, it's a whole new. But in, that doesn't really affect us in this job, but it kind of illustrates oh, I'm, I'm, the. Uh, I'm thinking of I'm yeah, both oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. The other Belmont mass transfusion. You're uh, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So this is it's called a sheath. Technically a mass, right? A sheath is a 
tempo loop in line, and you're going to identify it because it's going to have this side port coming off at 90 degrees. And it usually has kind of this rounded, rounded end and a freeway stop cock on it. So these come in variable sizes. Um, so sometimes they're great for infusion, sometimes they're not. They come from six French, nine French, twelve French. Um, really important thing to be able to recognize is this kind of side off configuration. That identifies as a sheet. The really important thing to know about these is they can be venous or arterial. So, and then you came, you didn't come from a rural program, I believe, rather than came from an elko. So if you've seen, if you've seen these flying from nice hospitals to to academic centers. If you fly from small facilities to academic centers, you're not going to see this. But if you start going with cath labs, IR suites, and ORs, you're going to see a lot of these. And again, they can be used during procedures in the femoral vein. They can be used IGA, um, but they're also used in the cath lab, in the radial artery, in the brachial artery, in the femoral artery. So if you see sense. this configuration, you cannot assume it is venous. And if you're going to use it to infuse, you abs absolutely need to confirm it. Get verbal confirmation, and I would argue you need to transduce it as well. If it's an IJ, unless it's a neuro patient, it's probably going to be venous. But in the drawing, all bets are off. And the wrist is always going to be arterial. Um, but just be really careful remembering that these lines are used for a variety of reasons in a variety of vessels, and you want to make sure you're in the right, you're not using arterial line. This doesn't quite make sense to me. Okay, the resuscitation. Oh, only procedural, right? No more of yeah. like, but some it depends what your facility stocks. So some stock nine French single linen sheets. So basically, imagine something this size. Just with this coming off the side. It's not common, but it happens. But you're right, it's not the choice line of resuscitation. Okay. But it happens, but usually you're right. They're usually used procedurally. Okay. Um, but when you're going to the cath lab, you're going to just ICUs where people have been getting procedures off, you know, in the IR. Do something different. Yeah, they might leave it as venous access after a procedure. Okay. They might have a they might do a procedure from a coagulated and pull it because it's high risk to pull it. So many times you can use it. You might be using as our true line after the cath lab. They sometimes certain cath labs will just put a transducer on it, send them back to the ICU. So you will see these in a variety of reasons. Um, and again, they come in different sizes, which makes them better or worse depending on the size for mass transfusion. But the big thing is to know that this can be arterial, and you got to double check. Cordis yeah. has a side port, but it's a seven or eight friend. All a cordis is is. A large single, it's a sheath. It's a large chorus is a, and I don't know if that's the trade name, but they, I think it's, it's packaged as cordis because cordis is just a long single limb uh, side port, if I recall. And they can probably, if they need to, do a wire guide to change out. Exactly. What they also, she, this is the proper line. Um, a six strand sheath is the proper line for the transmutation because it allows you to secure it properly. So if you see some of a transmutation pacemaker, they're going to have usually have this place and have the transient pacemaker put through it. Okay. Um, so again, central line, it's not crazy complicated, but procedurally, it might not be venous. You have to be really careful. Is there any uh, identifiable uh, traits that centers do to say, like, do they label it? They should, should they but they don't. Them? Okay. They should, but they don't. They should be transduced on the monitor if they're arterial. Um, well, generally, it's pure it's it definitely are arterial. Okay. Ideally, if they're venous, okay. but you can't ever count on it. Okay. So you want to start with asking whoever's the most be it the nurse, be it the doctor, depending on who seems to be the most involved with this patient's care and the history of them. Okay. First, you start by asking, and then you double check. Right? You ask, and then you confirm. Yeah. So, all right, and then we're getting or right, one of the goals today is to talk about hemodynamic monitoring. Um, this is your pulmonary artery catheter. Maybe some of you are familiar. Um, Ryan, have you ever seen one of these before? I've only studied. I've never had 
So could you and I call that you hear your FPC? Okay. And then because you guys do part of your FPC is swan number yes. of human dynamics states of shock, correct? Okay. So but I've studied and tested, but I've never put right. my hands on mm -hmm. it. So you're on PC. Great. They come in and you get in there. It's a mess. Each of this is a really nice uh, I borrowed this from CBICU and this is really helpful. So if we trace this line, right, we've got our map. Goes into ideally the SDC. Then you're gonna float this catheter and we're gonna we'd be reviewing this. So after the SEC. We're on one vessel, and what part of the heart do we go through? What valve do we go through next? To the uh, bicuspid. 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 Beautiful. What what chamber is this? That is the red right ventricle. Beautiful. What valve? The pulmonary. Perfect. And then the what vessel? Yeah, okay, perfect. Right, so pulmonary artery catheter. It's going to sit in the pulmonary artery. Um, when we put when you get put in, they know where they are by watching the waveforms on the screen. Um, so we can waveform. Right, the trigger array form, and then we can see a pulmonary artery form. Exactly. So there's a lot of ports on this. You've got your two ports from the map, right? We already talked about that. This is your big infusion port. Yep. Now that we've put the swan in there, we've taken up most of the space in the sheath. This is still your best infusion port, but it's going to be a lot slower than it used to be. Yep, and so, you have, so you can see, right, this swan yes. stuffs that sheath yes. pool. So if you're doing, if, you, if, if there's suddenly become a trauma patient, your mass transfusion because they are bleeding, right? You might want to consider pulling the swan. It's not really something you're going to come across, but it happens in the ICU. You just pull it back and leave it in, in its cover. Exactly. Okay. So following this back, I don't know if the pool works on this anymore. No, it's this test. So this has a syringe that inflates the balloon for which? Exactly. Let me see if this one works. This thing is going to heat up. So it's going to give us an idea of left ventricle. Uh, we're going to go into those numbers. So key things about this is this balloon open. This little syringe opens and closes. You want to leave it open. That way, if anyone wedged it and left air in it, if you want a syringe, always lose on air. Lock is always open. You've got parts go to a cardiac health monitor, which we're not going to have for you slime, but when you go to the ICU, for example, next for two weeks, we're going to talk to you about that. And then you've got the ports you want to transfuse. So, blue one goes to the right atrium. And this should say, and it says proximal. Yellow one. Goes to the pulmonary artery, okay. and it is labeled PA distal. Those are different openings. One's the mm -hmm. distal opening. One is in here. One, the PA one is at the tip. The proximal one is in the right atrium, all the way back here. So the three important things about this: this is where we're going to transduce our CVP. This is where we're going to transduce our pulmonary artery pressures. In a pinch, you can inject medications into this proximal one. Into the range room. That's fine. You absolutely cannot ever inject medications into the yellow one, into the pulmonary artery. That can cause, if you inject basal pressors or direct into PA, you find yourself in a world of hurt. So when you're setting these up, they're going to be a tangled mess. When you think of how to safely and pragmatically go about this, right? Look at the map, make sure it's well secure. Decide where your best volume transfusion port is. And then find the PA and make sure you know where that is so you never put anything into it. Right? Those are your big three things. Is this secure? What's my best infusion port? And what infusion port do I absolutely under almost no circumstances am I to use for medications? After that, you want you have a third infusion port that's a little skinny. Um, but having never seen this one, I want you to focus on those three things: the procurement, volume infusion. Never, ever, ever. Are we... uh, that is a great question, actually. We just changed. So we traditionally always 
Airman's old policy was you always have to transduce the PA, right, to monitor for permanent wedge. For M we only get two pressures on the monitor. So for MCS slice, this is problematic because one, for ECMO patients, you're going to have a flat PA anyways. Two, what we really wanted was CVP baseline. So right now our policy just got republished and it's actually, we're going to go over it in here. Um, no, you're good. Our new policy is that for MCS flights, you do not have to monitor the PA, but you have to pull the swan back to no deeper than 55 centimeters to re reduce the risk of, to keep it in the main branch of the PA and reduce the risk of permanent wedge. But for if you have a non-MCS patient, the policy states you still have you have to monitor the PA waveform. Um, and obviously, you know, listen for us to pull it back before it causes VTAC. Um, but for MCS flights, we have an exception because it takes up a port. Honestly, just leaving it without a transducer on with the comp the mess of lines is an option that our what we we're hearing from people is that they wanted that as an option. Um, so the policy just kind of updated on. And so like I said, uh, Ron, next week, you're all going to CVICU. Um, you're all going to CVICU, SICU, and Burn. When you're in CVICU, um, I really want you to ask them to see, see the swan patients. I want you to look at the swans and, and go over what ports are where, what transducer, uh, what ports, what sticks and deck and what's not. But you can see this in real life as a tangled heap on the bed, and that's really good practice. Gail's going to be presented, I believe, and she's amazing. For further okay, it's a lot. Exactly. And get this whole thing secured well. Okay, now why doesn't this have a secure in the back? Right. Oh, so this locks, let me show you around this. So the mat is going to be in a future day, right? Right? And then the swan. So this doesn't oh, have this is a you're right. This doesn't have gotten ripped off. Okay, it comes, it all they always come with this. It's gonna have okay. Always a strong word. <laughs> so these are called um, VIT cardiac output masks. They've got the permister and they've got this extra spike cord. They have older style of swan coronary catheters that they used to inject cold water into them, basically. It's a long, and they could look at the difference, the temperature change in the fluid as it flowed by the end of the catheter um, to check for cardiac output. Long story short, there are some facilities with these old style PA captures that don't lock. You're just going to see them kick to the neck. Okay. There's not much you can do about that, but take, make sure the MAC is searching in, secure the PA as best you can. Okay. But most of the time, good eye. Gotcha. I'm just one being different. Oh, yeah, it should look like this, right? Yes, sir. It's got okay. double, the double lock. All right, and then take oh, a I have a question. Yeah, sorry. Oh, don't sorry. Uh, this is pressure, pressure bagging on these is okay? Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, again, your flow rate is going to be much reduced once they've sure. gone in there, but you can pressure bag. Okay. Um, Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, sir. Right. Two, they have really long, really skinny. So this might be a line that is that six to get a six other AC and a really thick connotation. You might actually start considering um with a triple lumen, I don't almost always personally think it's not very answer. And that just putting a pressure bag on it for your triple lumen. A pick that's been indwelling for a while and it's got a little clotty. Oh my god, these things can be really slow. So no right answer, use your best judgment, but keep in mind this is our slowest flowing central line effectively. Yeah, that's usually how single they are just sorry. Okay. Okay. They do not heparinize these. They sometimes flush them with a very low concentration of heparin, 10 ml, uh, 10 units per ml. That can be flushed right into the patient. Yep. The only thing 
trying that's going to just like analysis catheter which you're rarely going to come across um, at these facilities but you could at a larger facility and a port so if someone has a port by the time you get to the facility if it's been accessed they've already pulled the heparin out but if you were ever at a facility and they were accessing someone's indwelling surgically indwelling uh, port that will be packed with heparin and will be drawn back um, but all of these central lines we're talking about Again, every some facilities flush them with 10 mLs, uh, 10 units per mL heparin, but that's a benign amount, and they're designed to be flushed for you. You don't have to pull it out in the end. Yeah, the, so the port, we don't, if you're going to have a central port, you're going to be needing to rely on the nurse port. You can either need to give your equipment to access yourself, or depending on your experience level, I have access to ports in my entire career. The uh, nurses at small facilities are really good at it because they have a lot of patients in their communities with cancer, yeah. 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 So, I mean, I would, for me, discretion is a better part of valor. I'm never gonna try to access a port if I have a nurse who knows how to do it better than me. Um, some people have come from jobs where they access them all the time, and that's great. I love that. So, <laughs> but fortune favors the bolt. All right, so we're kind of reviewing where it tips and tricks in the field. Always check the lumens for size and infuse lines to do this port. Important, but you gotta take a second to identify these. The largest port in the max flows three times faster than the smallest lumen. It's a big difference. Um, some lines, it's not a big difference. The max is really, really crucial. The size, do you wanna use your fast flowing your peripheral IV, or do you wanna use your long, skinny central line that you know isn't going anywhere? I'm not here to tell you what to do, but that's the trade off you're dealing with. Right. The next thing we need to talk about is utilizing these lines for infusion. And I thought you guys were already talking about this today. So if you go to the ICU tomorrow or next week and you're going to maybe see the nurses looking at medication compatibility. In theory, certain medications can mix together and precipitate. The reality is almost all medications can be infused together. Dr. Steve Bott, who I believe spoke to earlier this week, right, our one of our medical directors and cardiac anesthesiologists, in the OR, everything goes through one living. Um, in his entire career, he's never had a problem. So we're not gonna be at the bedside looking up medication compatibility. Um, in this program, it is accepted that everything can safely go together, at least for the time being, and they have any, precipita any issues precipitating in line. Uh, bicarbonate calcium, is, that's an exception. Now, if you're running, if you're running it for a free flow line, like in the OR, where it bleeds for an S line that's running, um, it sounds like they haven't had, they do it, I think, but that, you, that will precipitate. So if you're pushing bicarb and pushing calcium, you got to flush between. That's, that's the real, that's the real issue. The more important thing to focus on when you're setting these lines up is triple lumen catheters and all central lines can be long and they can dwell quite a bit of medication. Um, for example, oh, a volumetric. Yeah. So, right, if you look at the brown port on this Mac, it holds 1.7 mLs. So, if you go pick up a patient who's getting epinephrine or norepinephrine, say epinephrine drip, for their Mac, which is what you would do with it, right? Because it's a central line. And then they got volume resuscitated and they were doing a little better and they stopped the epinephrine before you got there. There's 1.7 mLs. So, epinephrine is mixed at 16 mics per mL. How much is push dose epi? Ten, right? Yeah. So one 10 mics. So you're gonna if you flush this, you're giving them 25 mics about of epi. So two and a half times the amount that you give for push dose epi. What do you think is gonna happen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I've seen probably four or five patients go to full on VTAC in my time in the ICU. I've seen the air dissection patients post surgery go to systolic blood pressures of 260 from this. Um, it's a huge problem. So you need to draw, you need to be drawing back and getting blood return and wasting. When you get to a central line that has had pressors, or you just, if you don't know if it's had pressors, discretion is a better part of valor, right? Yeah, it's easy, it's safe, and we're not talking benign amounts. 1.7 mLs is a massive amount of pressor. The other issue is if you put a if you take a drip that's pretty concentrated and going very slowly, 
and you Y in a faster moving meditation behind it, right, you're going to have this problem. So, here is our current. If we put norepinephrine on this, which is really concentrated, 64 mics per mil, it's four times as concentrated as our epidural. You probably, we've measured this before, but if you've got a CC volume film that you've been ahead of that port, so you call it one and a half. Now, if norepinephrine rate is going at two CCs an hour, that's pretty, that's not uncommon for a mildly sick septic patient, two, four CCs. These are moderate or reasonable in general doses. If you put your empty behind it or your amiodarone going at 40 CC an hour, um, Hour, what be it? You're taking, right, this little bit of fluid should take about an hour to infuse, and you're bolusing, right? It's the same thing, um, and the same thing, you can cause hypertension, malignant arrhythmia. Um, but, right, bring into a MEO drip going 40 cc's an hour, you're going to push a negligent. Way, you're going to take your amniote, which is going at 40 cc an hour, and you're going to give it now at, say, 42 cc an hour, effectively. That's not a big deal. When you're lying pressors together, it's the same thing. Um, epinephrine, usually, if you're with multiple pressors, vasopressin usually goes at 12 cc an hour. So you want to bleed your norepinephrine at 2 cc an hour of a slower drug into the faster drug. Does that make sense? Yes. Slow in the fast. Um, and then you just look at the, what the drug is. So. If heparin, if you bolus a couple cc's of heparin, nobody, it doesn't matter. In the end, they're going to get the same amount of heparin. So lead, lead pressors into non-pressors and slow in the fast are pretty much your, uh, your, your baseline rules. When you put pressors together, which you will often, that's when you're really looking at slow in the fast. Um, and then if you have norepinephrine, if you have one presser and one non-presser, Put the presser, bleed the presser into a, the, the other drug, and it's kind of a carrier. Um, and you're not going to bowl the pressers that way. Um, I don't know a lot of the drift, but those are the things you have to watch out for. So if I may interject, of course, there's a question. Yeah, of course. So I can see a situation where, okay, we're on one presser. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, we're maxing out a legal bit. Oh, we need to get something else going. Mm -hmm. Now they're wanting to Y into the same line. We're going to bowl us yep. a lot of. So when they miss it, so you of course, but they're hyper dancing. <laughs> <laughs> they're hyper dancing. And you're being at, you're quote, maxed out, you're being at 60 ml an hour. Well, now that one and a half ml that you're really? swinging up is negligible. It's negligible, it's negligible, it's negligible, negligible right? Yeah, I answer my you're, you're, that's a great way to think about it. And it's not saying that it's not without consequence, but we're being pragmatic. Can you see? Why those together still? Yeah, I would argue yes, yes absolutely. Um, because they're hyper but what is the consequence of tripling your relief effect compared to what they need? So this is where you you know if you feel like you can't wind together safely, right? You can use a free stop cock if I turn it into a dual port. You can ask for a manifold. You have another infusion port. You can use it. Um, or in that situation, the one cc of levo when they're getting sixty to seventy an hour and they're still crashing is not a big deal. Thank you guys for helping me. But no, these are like, you're guys. Are great. We're not having you centralize your thing. That's an awesome question. question. Oh, thank you. Even if you're just just report that. Yeah. Just do that. Yeah. 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 It's not just that impossible. If you're going to be doing it for presser administration, so if you're out of access, tomorrow IO is probably the preferred way, but every situation is different. That's not a rule. It's uh, probably most common practice. Is there a practice to go opposite the central line placement with the IO or whatever you can get? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Because um, it's always going to be on the right. 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 It as a go between the central way out of hand, and it was better than any peripheral line you could get, but a little bit worse. Yeah, from Moral, I mean, you ever been to the Moral Lab for IO? Ask them. It's so awesome to see they often have 
times or dissect the subclavian down the subclavian. And I mean, it's, it's like, it is really, it's instant. So several lines of communication we talked about is that they allow us to um, measure pressures in various parts of the heart. So the way this works is drive central line in a vessel, artery vein, it doesn't matter. You attach data column fluid going from the from the vessel the line back to the transducer. That pressure pushes on a little diaphragm, it takes that mechanical signal and converts it to an electrical signal. And that's what we see up on our monitor. That's These are not pre-primed, is that a correct? That's statement? correct. And we are going to talk about how to prime all this stuff. Um, either prep today, depending on timing, or if not in the ICU, um, we are going to be doing, I'm in the surgical ICU with you guys, and my station, we're going to mock package. We're going to do several lines, transducers, vent, pumps, and we're going to make you mock package the sickest patient on the CQ. That's kind of what my station's planned. That's what's planned for my patient station. Um, so that's the basic idea of how it works. Um, and the key thing we're in, you guys are getting some hands on with this is whether you're transducing an A line, a center, a Mac, a sheath, it doesn't matter. The transducer setup is the same. We're going to primary transducers, which we'll talk about. Get up to your line. Lines are going to have a cap of look at where we're transducing pressures on this board, that's not there, right? Um, I mean, it's okay to transduce through the absolutely, but if you have a swan, why would you? Right, we'll be an awful, we don't we don't usually have a swan, right? Right, but, but oh, okay, because that's part of the map, okay, exactly. Gotcha. And this is why the ICU day, I'm just gonna be we're gonna get tons of hands on with this. Um, that's our central line overview. I mean, that's it's an introduction. But the other thing you're going to run across is arterial lines. And water the attempt to get right. Very often in route. So similar to central lines, arterial lines can be placed in a variety of places. The most common is going to be radial artery. You might see brachial, and you might see femoral and crashing patients. You're probably not going to see a lot of pedal. Uh, arteries. I think I've seen one in my career. Um, and axillary artery, same thing. In these small facilities you're flying from, you're not going to, you're unlikely to see it. But femoral, radial, brachial. Why would a doctor in your response over a central venous? So venous line, right, gives us access for transfusion um, of product, medications, and invasive human egg monitoring for um, CVP and such. An arterial line rate gives you second to second data on um, what their blood pressure is. So an arterial line is a, is a monitor. It's not an intervention effectively, right? The central line allows for interventions. We're doing stuff to manipulate the patient's physiology with medications and uh, volume. An arterial line is giving us real time data to help us decide how effective their interventions are. Um, Perfect. Perfect. So they should be going for a venous line first. Yes. If you don't have access, if you don't have access to interventions, an A line, we're not going to be able to. We're not monitoring the impact, impact of anything. So indications for arterial line. There's ICU indications and there's flight indications. You're generally going to get what you get, right? There are more situations where you might be at a facility and say, hey, I really would like you to consider a central line before leaving, then there are, hey, I'd like you to put us an A line in for us. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, um, but if you don't have one, you're probably, you're most likely gonna make do. Central lines um, for medical patients, especially, there's definitely circumstances you might say, hey, if you don't, I'd really like to take the time if you can and put a central line in. To the other extreme, like, hey, we can't leave without a central line. You know, it, it, it's nuanced. Trauma is someone like with sepsis or something. Yeah, exactly. want to monitor that that venous status. Yeah, and most for flying, it's it's more about the access, right? Like if you have central line monitoring, CVP can be a great tool, but you're not going to ask for a central line generally for that purpose, especially because we have ultrasound, which we'll get into. Um, but 
if you don't have the access you need, if it's a trauma patient, you're probably gonna put an IO in and just go, right? Just what's best for a trauma patient is cold steel and bright lights and getting them to where they need to go. For a medical patient, um, oftentimes, right, you're not gonna immediately get an intervention where you're going that you really that you can't do. So you want to optimize them. So you can't safely guarantee press if they're pressure dependent and they might die if they lose their pressors and they have one crappy peripheral ID and that's all you can get. That's a time to ask for a central line before transport. You're also going to weigh, okay, are they coming from South Jordan in seven minutes or are they coming from Rock Springs? And again, these are there's no right answer to these questions. If you lose your ID, you can use a moral IO and route. But for a medical patient, when you know you have crappy access, you're much better off getting good access before you leave um, versus going down that path. Um, you know what I mean? Sure, but it, sure. It's well, it's helpful and it's good, but it's, remember, you, know, you, can infuse, you can infuse through it and just turn the knob. You can just turn. We're going to talk about that, but you can still set it up and infuse through it, and all you have to do is turn the transducer. Oh, so that's an IC. So that's another thing that we'll work hands on. Right on. Yeah, and it just depends. On, that's totally perfect for some patients. Yeah. It depends, right? Um, it's just good to know, but that's an option. So our two orientations, high risk nasal pressures are risky. Your cuff can become pretty unreliable when you have severe, severe basal constriction. Um, and it's hard to titrate drugs well when all you have is the cuff. So if you're on really high doses or multiple doses, that's a, they're gonna get an A-line at the ICT for that. Again, you probably don't need it for transport if they haven't put it in, but if they have, that's great. Some mechanical support patients have no pulse. Like, that's real. So we have a checklist for MCS that is faxed to the sending facility for stuff that is required of them before we take the patient. And one of them is an arterial line because a lot of these patients don't have a pulse. That's a, if a mandatory indication for an arterial line, um, it's in our policy, they can't get one. That's obviously, it is what it is. Um, shock, um, but again, we can for our arterial line safety you must always be transduced. So even if it's dampen and the waveform's not good and you're not gonna tr use it, it needs transduced because if one of them comes out without you noticing, they can, they can hemorrhage. Um, even a 20 gauge in the radial artery for someone who's on Coumadin can dump a couple of units. Um, I've seen a femoral line get displaced um, and dump about four units before it got figured out. Um, patient almost arrested. So you have to always transduce it so you know it comes out. You're also gonna want the numbers, obviously. Never, never, never inject medications. And that sounds like a no-brainer, but have a radial A line and a central line. The CBP transducer goes here. The radial A line transducer goes there. So, got a couple of choices. Decide. I've got other options. I'm not going to inject through my CBP on this flight because it's dark, it's bumpy, it's easy to screw that up. You're going to do a really, 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 really good job differentiating between the two and never screw it up. But it sounds obvious, but it's not. And then we talked about the sheaves, right? Sheaves can be venous or arterial, so we have to be really careful that we know which is which. Um, yeah, you can get big hematomas um, if these get dislodged. This is a more layaway run, so it's long, it's a lot it's long and flexible. Um, this is the one using the, the ORs at the U. A lot, most A lines are stiff, are kind of twenty gauge and stiff plastic. Sometimes we have these large sheaves that we talked about in the growth from oral artery, and we transduce those. If you have a sheath or a stiff A line in place in the groin you got to keep the patient pretty flat. You can 
it up to about 20 degrees. But past that, one, you can kink and kink the catheter and won't transduce. Two, you can cause vascular damage. Um, and three, if it's a short catheter, you can actually start pulling back. Um, and if it's a shallow placement, come out. So some more lay lines, generally, I think 20 degrees head to bed um, tops. If they're a crap, you know, if if it's a sick pulmonary patient that's so sick they can't tolerate laying down past 45 degrees, I would argue that patient is too unstable to transport transport without definitive airway anyways. But obviously, if they're decomposing your route, you got to do what you have to do. They're not going to they're not going to hemorrhage to that just because you spit them up. Right, but best practices for these big femoral lines, right? You want to try to keep them 20-ish degrees tops. So when you get to the bedside for central invasive lines, again, is it the right place? Is it the right place for safety? In a large vein. Not as it exactly not referred by SBC, but is it VNS? Have I confirmed it with X-ray, ultrasound, or waveform monitoring? Is it secured appropriately? cat lock or sutures um, and passes the, the window test that looks like it's not going to come out okay what course can work best with volume transfusion and is there any risk of bolusing basal active medication when i'm setting it up and there are any position restrictions so they have a big fat line with more artery or femoral vein as well right you want to keep them pretty flat 20 degrees tops unless there's extended with instruction and you follow both if that's your four point checklist um, it should cost you a lot of time and it should hopefully get you in and out and be able to keep the line safely in effect. 